resume integrity recording now. We're talking today about blood administration. What you need to see these, don't you? Building can hear us. <laughs> Ordinarily, when you think of blood, you think of taking blood. Well, today we're going to be talking about giving blood. And Margina's just come in, our guru. They're saying that also on Thursday and today, the volume seems to be going in and out on the speaker, both in Schulenburg and Anne in the other room. And they said they had the same problem on Thursday. Oh, I'll stop typing. <laughs> I know. We started taking so that we can have the fun. They said it's better. They said it's better. Thank you, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Appreciate it. What we're going to be talking about today is blood administration. And some of the things that we're going to be covering and going over are why do we give blood in the first place? What are the steps of administration? What are the complications that can arise because there are many? What types of blood products do we give? Why do we give them? Are there any religious or cultural considerations that we need to take into account? And are there any alternatives to giving blood? if someone does have an objection to it. Now, these are different from your notes. This is the talking portion, okay? Why do we give blood? What's the purpose of it? To replace lost blood. Why would you need to replace lost blood? Surgery anemias. Surgery anemias. Some sort of hypotension. But, but does this correct the problem? Not really. All blood does, or us giving blood does, is temporarily support the client until the underlying problem is corrected. Okay? If they've had surgery and we're giving them back some blood, yes, it does, it temporarily fixes it until the body can replace it. Same thing with trauma or other problems. It's a temporary support. <clears throat> what we're going to talk about right now are the steps of administration. Okay, just the basic what you got to do when. One of the things that's not listed in your notes that should be is the fact that you have to have the patient's consent. Okay? The physician writes the order to get a type and cross match and to transfuse one or two units of whatever blood product it is that he or she chooses. But before any of that occurs, you have to have the patient's consent. If the patient says, well, uh -uh, no, no, can't do that, why go through the expense of getting all this blood prepped if it's just going to sit there? Okay, so you have to have the patient's consent to do that. When you're thinking about administration, you have to think about what size needle is appropriate for giving blood. Generally, we like to say an 18 gauge. You can put blood through a 20, but you're risking some damage to the red blood cells. It goes in faster, more efficiently, less damage to the blood cells with an 18. So an 18 is the preferred gauge size. You always have to administer it through a filter. If you don't use a filter, you risk bacterial contamination for your client. You also risk putting clots in if the blood is gone. It needs to be a closed system so that you're not going to be opening it and interrupting it and introducing more bacteria or pathogens into the system. We only did it with normal saline. Anything else can cause the blood cells to open up, to break apart. <laughs> to hemolyze. And we don't give any additives with it. You never hang a piggyback. You don't give pain medication. Nothing is added to the blood. You do any of that, you're putting the patient at risk. You never refrigerate the blood on the unit. <clears throat> Why? 
spoons with the pieces of wood? Well, no, it's more that the fact that the, the um, refrigerator on the unit might have fluctuations in temperature. Okay, it might get a little too warm, a little too cold, people are opening it and closing it all the time. And if the blood, before you're getting ready to administer it, changes temperatures a lot, ups and downs, you're risking growth of pathogens. So we do not refrigerate it on the unit. You have to confirm the blood product. You've got to make sure you've got what the doctor ordered. You have to confirm the identification of the patient. Once the physician has ordered that the client is going to have blood, the lab will come and draw blood and put a special band on the client. That's the blood band. You have to make sure that the numbers that come on the blood product match what are on the client. Okay, so it's more than just a hospital identification band. You have to check the compatibility both the ABO, the blood type, and the RH factor to make sure that you're not going to be giving something that's incompatible with the client and setting them up for complications. We're going to talk more about complications in a minute. Again, check the blood product against the physician's order. You have to check the expiration date to make sure that it's not expired, just like you would with any medication. You have to look for clots. You don't want to automatically start running something in that's already started to clot. Ask the client their name. Check the armband again. And you've got more than one person doing this. You've got two licensed personnel doing this. An unlicensed person can, depending upon the hospital, can go to the blood bank to pick up the blood and check the blood at the blood bank along with the person from the blood bank. But at the bedside, giving it to the patient, it has to be two licensed people, one of whom has to be a registered nurse. You want to make sure you've taken vital signs. And you usually want to take the baseline vitals before you go to pick up the blood. Because if the client has a fever or has some other problem going on with them, you may have to notify the physician to get verification or approval that you're going to go ahead and give the blood now. They may want to premedicate for some reason. So take like baseline vitals before you even get the blood. Then once you've gotten the blood on the unit and you've checked the identification, you've done all that great and wonderful stuff, you are going to take vital signs again. You want to make sure that the infusion line has been primed with saline, normal saline. You don't want to use D5, you don't want to use lactated ringers. All of those things could cause hemolysis. You only give blood with normal saline. You want to begin the infusion very, very slowly. Okay. I meant to bring a um, picture showing some of the or tubing, so I was going to bring it and pass around so you could see. The tubing always has a Y in it, so that you can have the saline going from one line and the blood coming from another. Okay. But they Y together above the filter. You adjust the rate slowly. If the client is going to have a reaction to this, you want to know early on, before they've gotten too much blood in them. So you start the rate at no more than two milliliters per minute for the first 15 minutes. If they're going to have an acute reaction, you want them to have it early before too much blood is gone. In. Okay? So how many mLs would they have gotten in the 15 minute period? No more than 30. Okay? So you really want to start it slowly. You're going to remain with the client and you're going to take their vital signs. I like to do them every five minutes. In most hospitals where I work, we erred on the side of caution. We would take the vital signs every five minutes for the first 15 minutes. I think the form at St. Joe's, or the policy at St. Joe's is you take your baseline vitals and you take it 15 minutes after. I like to be a little more cautious than that. I like to know very, very quickly if there's going to be any type of reaction. 
you observe for those signs and symptoms. If you see any changes in the vital signs, if you see any hint of a reaction, you stop the transfusion immediately. Okay? You don't want any more blood going into the client than has to be to find out. If no reaction is noted, you will infuse as prescribed. Usually you can put in a unit of blood over about two hours. Okay? It can be less, but you don't want it any more than four hours. You're going to check the client frequently, watching for any signs and symptoms of a reaction. Monitor their vital signs every 30 minutes. Again, I know the form at St. Joe's says baseline vitals after 15 minutes and at the end of the infusion. I think you should be a little more cautious than that. Okay, take the vital signs a little more frequently. You document before, during, and after the infusion. You don't want to infuse quickly unless it's an emergency. Okay. Too quickly, because the blood is cold, we're taking it from the refrigerator, and we're not letting it sit out on the unit, it can cause chills. If you're giving it quickly, you cause chills, you can cause arrhythmias. Okay, and you learn all about arrhythmias in the last few weeks. Not good. <clears throat> there are blood warming devices. If you have an emergency and you have to give the blood quickly, the client's been in a massive trauma or for whatever reason they're having to infuse a lot of blood, they can use a blood warming device. We routinely use them in the OR. You can, again, infuse a unit of packed red blood cells over about two hours. But again, you never want to exceed four hours. The reason being, you can be giving microorganisms to the client. You're putting them more at risk for sepsis. So, if the blood is not infused in four hours, you take it down anyway. Okay. You'd have to call the physician to get special orders to exceed that. What could you do if you had a client who was a cardiovascular risk and you couldn't give it to them very quickly? What could you do? Smaller amount to start with. Smaller amount to start with. Smaller amount to start with. You can have the blood bank divide that unit of blood into smaller amounts. So you can give that smaller amount in that same four-hour period to be safer for your client. Complications, what we're going to talk about now. What do you do if you have a blood transfusion reaction? You're going to stop the blood. Okay? You're going to stop the infusion. But you have to keep the IV line patent. You have to keep the IV line taken. Now, if you've got a tubing full of blood, if you've got a tubing full of blood and you stopped it up here at the infusion at the clamp, the controller, and you turn on the normal saline that's on the other thing, what's going to happen to that blood that's in the line? It's going to be pushing it in. So what are you going to have to do? Completely disconnect. completely disconnect that blood, okay, to start your saline, to keep your IV line patent, okay? You don't want to continue giving all that blood that's in that tubing. If you're discontinuing it, <coughs> truly discontinue it, okay? You need to notify the MD and the blood bank. Depending upon the type of, infu of complication, we're going to talk about very minor ones that we would probably continue with the blood <laughs> and major ones where we're taking it down, we're sending it all back to the blood bank. You need to recheck the IV tags and the numbers to make sure that you didn't make a mistake when you were checking your bands and checking your numbers to make sure that this truly was the blood the patient was supposed to get. So recheck the tags. <clears throat> you're going to monitor the vital signs, watch what's going on with the client, and you're going to watch the urine output. Because one of the complications that can occur if you have hemolysis with the blood cells, what's going to happen at the glomerulus? 
All of that stuff is going to go into the glomerular list. You're going to have glomerular nephritis. You can put the client up for renal failure. Okay? So you monitor the urine output. You treat the symptoms per the end the order. As I said, some complications can be very mild, like a fever or a, a rash, an itch. And the physician may say, continue the blood after giving Benadryl or after giving Tylenol. Oftentimes, if we know a client has this type of mild reaction, we'll even pre-medicate them beforehand. We'll talk a little bit more about this in a minute. Save the blood back <coughs> the tubing, and we send it back to the blood bank. There is a transfusion reaction report that you have to <coughs> do to document. And again, collect urine and blood specimens. The most common cause of hemolytic reaction, remember how I said when the blood would break apart, the blood cells would open up? That's a hemolytic reaction. And it's the, or the most common cause of that is ABO incompatible blood. Okay? <coughs> you were giving the client blood that didn't match his blood type. Antibodies in the recipient's blood react with the antigens on the donor's blood. The client's body sees that it's non-self and it reacts. And because of this antibody antigen reaction, the blood starts clotting. Okay? And it's going to block the blood flow in the smaller capillaries because of this agglutination, this pumping up. And one of the places it can clump up are in glomerulus. <coughs> you also have, because of the blood breaking up, you've got the release of the hemoglobin into the plasma. This is usually going to occur in the first 15 minutes. That's why you want to get it very, very slowly to make sure that there is no mix-up in the client and are the blood that you're giving to the client. It'll usually happen in the first 15 minutes. That's why you want it to go very, very slowly for that first 15 minutes so that they won't have gotten as much and you can stop it before there's a major, major reaction. Any hemolytic reaction is not good. <clears throat> there are delayed reactions that can occur anywhere between 2 and 14 days later as the client's immune system slowly wakes up and starts producing antibodies. Things that you see <coughs> if you have a hemolytic reaction, and this is an acute reaction. You have chills, fever, low back pain, flushing, tachycardia, tachypnea, hemoglobinuria, and hypotension. The classic signs that you see are low back pain and a feeling of apprehension. If your client tells you, you know, I'm just not feeling right. This is just not, it just, everything's just not right. I just feel like something's going wrong. Listen to them. <coughs> Check those vital signs. They could be having the beginning of a hemolytic reaction. I found this picture that I put on to give you a, a visual of what's happening, what systems are involved with the hemolytic reaction. The systemic, you have the fever of the chills, like I mentioned. In the vascular system, you're going to see hypotension. You're going to see potentially uncontrollable bleeding. Potentially. In the transfused vein, where the transfusion was going, there'll probably be some inflammation. And there may be a sensation or a feeling of heat. Uh, that low back pain in the lumbar region, it's around the kidneys. In the urinary system, you're going to see hemoglobin urea, like we mentioned, and you'll probably have some bilirubinemia. Okay, hyperbilirubinemia. <clears throat> they can get chest pain with all of this going on, as well as the increased heart rate. <clears throat> 
So hopefully this picture will help you remember hemolytic reaction a little bit more easily. What do you do as a nurse? What's the first thing you're going to do? Stop the transfusion. Okay. Maintain the IV line. Once you've done that, you've notified the physician, you're going to be drawing blood samples, sending urine, or getting urine specimens, sending those to the lab. And you're going to keep the blood pressure up because remember they get hypotensive with a colloid solution. Okay. Something like, um, could be D5 half-grown saline, could be lactated ringers, could be just normal saline. Okay? Because you stop the blood. You can switch them over to some other solution to keep the blood pressure up. You're probably going to be giving them diuretics because you want to keep the urine flowing through. You want to put all this stuff through the glomerulus to cut down on the damage that could occur. You may or may not insert a Foley catheter. If your client's very with it, you may just have them voiding every hour so that you can monitor what the, the urine output is. But most often now you've got a very sick client and you've got a Foley catheter in so that you can monitor hourly urine. You do not transfuse again until the blood bank has done a new cross match because something was wrong in the beginning. Okay? So the blood bank has to come back and type and cross match again before you would even think about retransfusing this client. Another reaction that can occur, and it's an acute reaction, is a febrile reaction. What's a febrile reaction? Fever. It's a good song. It's usually due to leukocyte incompatibility. White blood cells that are still mixed up in there. We try to avoid this a lot. If you're getting packed red blood cells, very often they'll have washed them before to try to get rid of all the white blood cells that might be in there. You also use a filter that will help get rid of the white blood cells. All of these things are to try to help you prevent having a febrile reaction. It could also be due to a sensitivity to any platelets or plasma proteins that might be in the blood. Febrile reaction manifestations that you're going to see? Well, you're going to have a fever. Okay. Sudden chills and fever. The temperature is going to go up greater than one degree centigrade. They'll have a headache. They'll probably have flushing going along with this fever and chills. And they'll feel anxious and they'll have muscle aches and pains. Okay. It's like having flu. Very often, if you notify the physician of this, they're going to say, give them Tylenol and probably give them Benadryl. You want to make sure that you're not giving aspirin to someone who's thrombocytopenic. Okay? Because if they're thrombocytopenic, they're going to be at risk for bleeding. Right? And if we give them aspirin, we're going to increase that risk. And again, don't restart the infusion until the physician says to. But if it's a very mild febrile reaction, they'll usually say, give them Tylenol, restart. Mild allergic reaction, this is where Benadryl is really helpful. That's usually because of the sensitivity to the proteins that are ordinarily in the donor's blood. You're going to see things that you would have with a, an allergic reaction. The itching, okay? the flushing, like you could have like a hive reaction. Okay? And they'll give them Tylenol and Benadryl. And oftentimes they'll go ahead and start the blood again if it's mild. Okay? If it's a more severe reaction, they're going to stop the blood and they may need to support the patient with epinephrine and with corticosteroids. If you've ever had an anaphylactic reaction because of these things or whatever, what do they do? They give you a shot of adrenaline. Same kind of thing with the epinephrine. 
Okay, epinephrine. Adrenaline is epinephrine. And it corticosteroids steroids to stop the inflammatory process. This is just a picture showing the, the um, hives, the itching, the allergic reaction they can get. Another problem that can occur, and this one can be much more severe, is circulatory overload. I sort of like this picture. It says your test reveals that you're retaining fluids. <laughs> and that's what's happening with circulatory overload. If you've got a client, well, that answers my question. Who's at risk for this? CHF. Somebody who has CHF. Okay. Somebody who may have kidney problems. They can't get rid of excess fluids. You want to make sure that you infuse slowly, monitoring the vital signs the entire time. Symptoms that you're going to get are going to be those like congestive heart failure. They're going to have a cough. They'll have dyspnea. They'll have pulmonary congestion. They can also have a headache. They can have tachycardia. HT, what do I put that for? No. Hypertension. I'm not sure why I put that down for. Maybe hypertension. You forgot the end. Hypertension. Thank you. I forgot the end. <laughs> Stick an N on there because that would be hypertension. <laughs> you know, typos. We don't mean them to happen, but they do. <coughs> There is central venous pressure, and I think Mr. Hutton talked with you last week about central venous pressure and hemodynamics. If you had someone in the ICU, you would be able to measure this. This is not something that we ordinarily measure on the regular med search for. But the central venous pressure would be elevated. PA wedge pressure would be elevated. Again, someone's going to have to be in the ICU to be getting these measurements. Nursing management. You want to keep the patient upright so it's easier for them to breathe. You want to keep the feet dependent because that's going to cut down on the amount of fluid that goes back into the system that you've already overloaded by getting the blood too fast. You can tell I like to get blood slowly. <clears throat> so you've got the feet in a dependent position. You're going to administer diuretics as ordered by the physician, again, to try to help them get rid of this fluid. If you've got a client who has renal failure, can you give them diuretics? You can give them diuretics, but it's probably not going to help. Okay? Because that's their problem in the first place. They can't get rid of that fluid. Um, give them oxygen to help increase the O2 in the system and give them morphine. When Mr. Hutton was talking with you about chest problems or about heart problems, what did, why did you give someone morphine? Vasodilator. Vasodilator. What else? Decreased pain. Decreases pain. Decreases that reaction, stress reaction. Anxiety. Okay. Yeah. All of those things go into uh, to effect. So it's a good thing to give them. Again, you have to have a physician's order for this. Um, the best way to treat circulatory overload is never have it occur in the first place. Recognize if your client is going to be at risk for it and adjust the flow rate appropriately. If you have a client who's going to be at risk, make sure that you have the blood bank divide that blood unit into smaller amounts so you can give it slowly. <laughs> Okay. Another acute reaction is sepsis. The product becomes contaminated or infected because of improper handling, improper storage, whatever reason. It rarely occurs, excuse me, it rarely occurs that the blood has been handled appropriately. It's a massive infection because you've been putting infected blood or contaminated blood into the client. So you're going to see chills. You're going to see a high fever. You're going to see probably vomiting and diarrhea and hypotension. 
your first reaction to hypotension would be to increase the blood because you think, oh no, we've got to help give them more. No. You've got to support them with something else. You've got to stop the blood, notify the physician, and start doing all these other things. You have to get a culture of the client's own blood and send that blood back along with the, whatever blood was left in it, the tubing with the blood in it, all of that goes back to the blood bank. And you have to treat the client symptomatically. If they're hypertensive, you're going to give them vasopressors to help keep the blood pressure up. Antibiotics to try to treat the whatever the bacteria or whatever the infective agent was. You're going to get them IV fluids. Okay. All these things to be supported. Again, the best way to treat this is to prevent it. You don't ever want this to occur in the first place. Proper blood bank procedures with collecting, with processing, with storing, with transfusing, will cut down on any risk of sepsis. Make sure that you infuse the bag of blood or the blood product within four hours of the starting time. Once you spike that bag, it's four hours. Massive blood transfusion reactions. Again, this is an acute one. I actually have not seen this in my practice because I don't usually work in like the ER. You have someone that comes in with a major trauma, or they've been in the OR and they've lost more than you know, half the volume of their blood, and we've got to replace it with like 10 units of blood. They're going to be at risk, at risk for this massive blood transfusion reaction. It usually occurs when the replacement of red blood cells exceeds the total volume that the client has within 24 hours. So we're giving them massive amounts of blood. The clotting factors, the albumin and the platelets that weren't in packed red blood cells lead to an imbalance between what the client, what you've given the client and what they have. They can also have this because of, uh, they can develop hypothermia because we give them so much cold blood so quickly. They can get a citrate toxicity, which can cause hypercalcemia because the blood is usually stored the citrate to keep it from clotting, okay, and to, to keep it good to use. But that citrate will cause the, the calcium that's in the patient's bloodstream to bind to it and then the client will get hypocalcemia and have all the arrhythmias and things that can come along with that. Likewise, if the blood has been stored for a long time, potassium can be released from the red blood cells. So now we're giving them this blood and we're causing them to become hyperkalemic and setting them up for all the arrhythmias that you talked about before with the cardiac system. <laughs> So with massive blood transfusion, you've got several different things that can occur. Those were all acute reactions. Okay? Those were all acute blood <coughs> and complications. These are some of the delayed transfusion reactions that you can have. <coughs> One of them is iron overload. And... Iron overload. You've got, this occurs when you've got someone that you've been giving a lot of transfusions to over a long period of time. Say you've got someone with chronic anemia, okay, and you've been having to give them blood transfusions. Excess iron gets deposited in the heart in the liver, in the pancreas, and in the joints. And this causes dysfunction. It can cause congestive heart failure. It can cause dysrhythmias. You can get impaired functioning of the thyroid and the gonads. Uh, arthritis, cirrhosis. If you've got these deposits in the pancreas, do you think the pancreas is going to be working properly? No. So they're going to be at risk for 
diabetes, all because of this iron overload. And again, it's usually in someone who's had, I said, a lot of blood over a period of time, more than 100 units of blood you know, over a lifetime. So that's a lot of blood for someone who has chronic anemia. Could be for someone who had um, chronic leukemia. They've gotten a lot of blood, more than 100 units over a lifetime. Graft versus host disease is another chronic or delayed transfusion reaction that can occur. And with this one, what you're going to see is similar to that allergic reaction that we were talking about, because with this, you've got blood product that is from a client who's got a good immune system, and you're giving it to a client who has immunosuppressed blood system. Okay? So now the blood that you're giving to the client can attack the client. Okay? Because it recognizes that it's different. So that's graft versus host. The blood that you're giving is the graft. So you're going to see fever, rash, diarrhea, maybe they can develop hepatitis or signs of hepatitis with this. There's no effective treatment available. It's all supported. And so they try to prevent this by, if you have someone who's immunocompromised, they'll give them irradiated blood. And that irradiated blood cuts down on the ability or, or shuts down the ability of that, of those, that blood product mounting a reaction. Okay, so irradiated blood products for someone who is immunocompromised. Another delayed transfusion reaction that can occur, but it occurs much less now because we've gotten much better about screening people who might have these infections. If you have someone who's ever had hepatitis, they're not allowed to give blood. That's why, has anybody ever given blood? Raise your hand if you've given blood. Okay. What are some of the questions that they ask you? If you've been out of the country. If you've been out of the country. Why would they care if you've been out of the country? Other countries have diseases that we may not, that you may not have been exposed to, and you could be bringing it back. If you were allowed to donate blood, you could be introducing that into the bloodstream or the blood system. Okay. What are some of the other questions they ask you? Sexual partners. Sexual partners. Pretty personal question, isn't it? <laughs> it is, but they need to know. Mm -hmm. Why do they need to know? Because if you've had, um, could have AIDS, you could have... If you're at risk for contacting some of these diseases, right. we don't want that into the blood that we're going to be then transfusing to someone else. They don't run a blood test? They do run blood tests, but they try to screen it out before. All righty. So these are some of the... the Ms. Conley? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Can I ask if you've had any recent tattoos or piercings? Sure. You're right, they do. They ask if you've ever had any recent tattoos or piercings. Why is that? Just for hepatitis. They want to try to make sure you don't have hepatitis. Okay. We do try to screen for these. But, Things can <coughs> tests. The blood supply system is very, very safe. You usually don't have to worry about that. But other countries aren't quite so safe as ours is. And so one of the culture considerations we're going to be talking about deals with that. Okay, let's take a short break, shall we? Before we get into this next section, <coughs> I'm going to stop quickly so that it reminds me of it, but I'm restarting it anyway. <coughs> Different things that can be done if you've got a client 
who doesn't want to have a blood transfusion for whatever reason. You can do autologous donation. What autologous donation is taking blood away from a person and then transfusing it into the same person. Okay? You donate blood to yourself. It's autologous donation. And it's often done prior to surgery. Used to when we would do joint joint replacement <coughs> surgery, routinely we would have to transfuse oh, about five units of packed red cells after a hip replacement surgery <coughs> because they lost so much blood. So over a period of time, you would have someone do an autologous trans or donation. So they would have that blood stored up waiting for them for after their surgery so it could be given back to them. It can be frozen and it can be stored for up to three years. So you would have a bit of a time to prepare for this planned surgery. Autologous donation is not available for someone who has a trauma because you can't plan it. Okay. Now, if they had planned on having surgery and had banked some blood, but then they had an accident, they could have their blood back. Okay. But it's not something that you can plan for trauma-wise. Is that an option for like, people that don't believe in blood transfusions? Or is that kind of... I, I know. I, just want to I believe it is, but okay. again, I I'm not 100% think. certain. But we'll be talking about that a little bit in a bit. Are the blood banks located within the hospital? Larger facilities, yes. Okay. Auto transfusion is another thing that can occur. It's like an oncologist donation in that the client is getting back their own blood. But they use a, a collection device. And this is usually in the hospital, or excuse me, in the uh, operating room during surgery. Or I suppose it could also be done in ICU if you have someone who's losing a lot of blood that way as well, or in the emergency department. But they use a collection device. And the collection period is usually two to four hours. Can't be any more than that because you put the client at risk of bacteria infection. They have to monitor the coagulation studies as well to make sure that you're not going to have clotting going on, bizarre things going on that you're reintroducing into the client. But that's all the transfusion. Now, what types of blood products do we give and why? You know, blood has different things in it. There are different components. And if you look at blood in a test tube, it's going to start separating out. The red cells are going to drop down because they're heaviest. And right above the red cells, there's going to be a little layer, uh, layer of white cells. They're not quite as heavy as the red cells. And then you'll have the plasma that will rise to the top. And in the plasma, it's a lot of water, a lot of fluid. But it's also got all of the blood proteins that you expect to have, the uh, albumin, <coughs> the globulin, the fibrinogen. And it also has amino acids and sugar, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to decide, or the physician decides, what does the client need? Do they need whole blood? Do they need the plasma, the white cells, and the red cells together? If they had a massive transfusion, excuse me, a, a massive trauma of some sort, maybe they do need whole blood. Generally, though, we're going to give packed red blood cells because we don't necessarily need to give the client all of those things that are in the whole blood. They really need this to boost their oxygen carrying capability. Okay? They need more hemoglobin. They need to be able to carry oxygen to the cells. So we can give them packed red blood cells. It's prepared from whole blood, either by sedimentation, just like with this picture that we had a while ago, letting it sit there, and the, the red cells will drop to the bottom because they're heavier. Or it can be by centrifuge. Anybody ever ridden on that um, Gravitron at the State Fair, <laughs> where it swings you around? I'm making 
sides here, so I thought I'd better turn this back on. It slings you around the outside. Well, that's like a centrifuge. So that's what they can use to prepare that blood, pack their blood cells. One unit usually equals around 250 to 350 mLs. Okay. It's more by weight. But giving someone packed red blood cells allows those other components, the platelets, the albumin, the plasma, to be used for other purposes. Okay. The reason you would give someone packed red blood cells or if they need more oxygen carrying capability, they're anemic. Or maybe they've had acute blood loss. Okay, so we're going to give them packed red blood cells. We can also have frozen red blood cells. And to freeze the blood, glycerol is added, and that will actually protect those red blood cells so that they can be stored for up to three years. If you had someone who was doing an auto or an autologous donation, they would be putting glycerol to help protect those red blood cells so that they can be stored. Anytime you've used frozen red blood cells, once they thaw them, they have to use them within 24 hours. You can't refreeze them. <clears throat> on and say, oh, well, I don't really want to get it here. Let's just take it back in the freezer. No, you can't do that. Okay? Once it's been thawed, it has to be used. When they use frozen red blood cells, they're usually uh, leukocyte-free because they've been washed to remove the white blood cells and the plasma proteins. This is how they do it. Okay, the autologous donation that I said, the autotransfusion. If they've ever had uh, someone, or if someone has ever had a febrile reaction to a transfusion, that's one of the things we ask the clients. <coughs> Have you ever had a transfusion reaction? <coughs> if they say, yeah, they've had a febrile, they got a fever when they were taking it, the doctor had to give them Tylenol and before they could continue with it. Well, the physician is probably going to say, let's use washed, leukocyte poor red blood cells because they've been washed to try to prevent having any of that reaction. Um, they're not used as often except in autotransfusion because the filters will help remove the white blood cells. So it's not necessary. Platelets? Why would we give someone platelets? <laughs> they don't have enough platelets. Okay. They're usually symptomatic. Okay. Usually between 10 and 20,000 or less. But symptomatic. It's prepared from fresh whole blood within four hours after collection. And a unit of platelets only has 30 to 60 ml, so it's a very small little unit, really. And they do what's called platelet phoresis, so they can spin those platelets out and get them. Platelets can be kept at room temperature for up to five days. Yeah. So storage is a, a different factor here. <coughs> you have to, do I say it on the next slide? Yeah. You have to agitate the bag periodically, because what do platelets do? Plump, plump. So, while you're giving it, you need to agitate it so that it's not going to pump up. You can just kind of shake it around. Shake it a little bit. It. No, you can shake it around a little bit. Now it's good enough. And you usually expect the platelet count to go up about 10,000 per unit. Okay. If you don't get an increase, there's something else going on. Okay. Maybe they have a problem with their spleen, and the spleen is sequestering it, pulling the, the platelets out, getting rid of them. Fresh frozen plasma is that liquid portion that's separated out. Okay, it's separated, it's frozen, and one unit is usually 200 to 250 mLs. And we use this because it has clotting factors. Okay? If you have someone who is 
the boys are low on potty factor, you might need to, to give them this condition to order this instead. You have to use it within two hours of thawing. We don't use it quite as much because of plasma expanders unless they're deficient in the clotting factors. Albumin is another thing that can be separated out from the plasma. And it can be stored up to five years. And it's available in a 5% or 25% solution. And giving 25 grams in 100 ml is osmotically equal. What does that mean? 500 ml. It moves the fluid. It'll keep the fluid in the hemodynamic or in the um, circulatory system as opposed to allowing it to leak out. Because what is albumin supposed to do? Hold fluids into the, the blood system and not allow it to leak out into the tissues. Cyclose molar, and again, it keeps the water in the circulatory system as opposed to allowing it to leak out into the intravascular space. They use it for hypovolemic shock or hypoalbuminemia. If it's hypovolemic shock, giving out human will cause water to pull out from the, the tissues into the circulatory system okay, and keep it there. Would you also infuse like saline or something mm -hmm. in that situation? Prior precipitate is another thing that's going to be used to replace clotting factors. Uh, it's prepared from fresh frozen plasma, because remember the plasma is where all those clotting factors were and all that good stuff. It's usually about 10 to 20 mLs per bag, and it can be stored for up to a year. Once they thaw it, it has to be used. It's just like things in your, your freezer. You know, you can't thaw things out and then pop it back in. That's not good food technique, good preparation technique. You're putting it at risk for having bacteria in your foods. How does so, the doctor determine which, because you have three now that can help with the clotting factors. Mm -hmm. So how do they pick which one to use? What they're listing or what they're missing, what their basic problem is, what the disease is. This would be used for someone who had like, um, I was thinking von Willebrand's, I studied it in pediatrics already, von Willebrand's disease, hemophilia. They were only missing clotting factors, specific clotting factors. I put this on just so you can see the different blood groups that there are. Who knows what their blood uh, grouping is? Okay, let's, let's just do this and see. I used to have it written down about the different percentages. Who, how many people are blood type A? Schulenberg, I can't see you. You're going to have to turn your light on so I can see if you've got your hands up. Okay, blood type A. Two folks in Schulenberg or three folks in Schulenberg? I can't see the back row. Okay. There's two in Schulenberg. Two. Okay. Raise your hand if you're B. Blood type B. <coughs> you care if it's negative or positive? I'm not asking about that right now. Fewer than A, huh? What about O? Whoa, baby. <laughs> Look at that. What about AB? Even fewer, okay? So our sampling here showed that most people in this, in this sample were blood type O. And if I'm remembering correctly, y'all aren't normal. <laughs> if I'm remembering correctly, I think the most common blood type is A. Okay. But then you've got to throw in that RH factor. Okay. All those who are A, raise your hand again. Now, if you're A 
Negative, put your hand down. Mostly it's A positive. I believe A positive is the most common blood type. Okay. That was just, you know, a little aside there. Wake you back up, get your hands going. It's important to know what your client's blood type is. When they do the type and cross match, they're going to check this out. They'll know what is their blood grouping and what is their what are the gluten factors that are there on their blood, excuse me, on the RBCs. Are they going to be, for example, A with anti-B agglutinins. Those folks could have blood from A or from O. Because okay. they're RH or A negative. Okay. You can't see this whole thing, can you? I'm missing something mm -hmm. down there. The O's. The O's are farther down on this. The blood bank will go in with a type and cross match. They'll be checking for all of these agglutins so that they can know is somebody going to be compatible. Okay. When you're giving blood, we talked about the administration techniques, we talked about the different blood products that are available, we talked about the different complications that can occur and what you should do about them. What if your client has religious or cultural objections to getting blood? Do you know of anybody who is? Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. They're the only religion. I was trying to do a search to figure out, okay, was there any other religion, world religion, that would not accept blood products. And Jehovah's Witness was the only one I could really find. And it can be deadly. Okay. If you have someone who's Jehovah's Witness who will not accept blood products, it can affect their disease so profoundly that it can lead to death. My husband's aunt was Jehovah's Witness. And she had, not only did she not come to our wedding, because it was held at another church, denomination, <laughs> and they could only go to Jehovah's Witness Church. They came to the um, rehearsal dinner before, but they didn't come to the wedding because it was a Lutheran church. But she developed chronic myelogenous leukemia. She could potentially still be alive today, 10 years later, had she accepted blood transfusion, because that's a common treatment option for someone who has chronic myelogenous leukemia. Her death was hastened because she could not accept blood transfusions. It's a personal choice that someone makes. And someone could make this choice not because of their religion, but because of their culture. I did a search on different cultures to see, was there any culture? I was thinking, you know, mainly Middle Eastern, because I'm not very familiar being a, a Western woman. I lived in the Far East, I lived in Japan, I lived in South America, so I'm familiar with those cultures, but I've never lived in Israel or in Syria or any of the Middle Eastern countries. So I tried to do a search to see if I could find anything that would affect someone culturally. And I didn't really find anything. What I found was there are cultures that are hesitant to accept blood transfusions. For example, example, recent immigrants from Russia would be very hesitant to accept a blood transfusion because their blood supply is not as safe as ours is. But with proper education, with need, they would accept it. Same thing with a lot of South American countries. There would be a little fear factor, again, because their blood supply system wasn't as, as um, safe as ours. 
but with proper education, with the physician assuring them or the nurse assuring them of the need for this transfusion, they would accept it. And do you guys know of any, any other cultures or any other religions other than Jehovah's Witness that won't? You're right about the Russian spy. Mm -hmm. I had a friend that broke his back over the summer and had to get a blood transfusion, and he was all... Should I do it? Should I do it? Yeah. I was praying the whole time, like, please be good. I don't want him yeah. to get something. And he's, yeah, he was very hesitant. And he was Russian background? Mm -hmm. Was he a relatively new immigrant? Um, or had he been here for a long time? He'd been time? here for a while, but it's, mm -hmm. but not, I don't know, but probably about 15 years, 10 years. Hmm. 10 or 15 years, and he still had that basic fear, because it was the way he grew up. He did it. Mr. Hutton or Dr. Bixler, Ms. Kutash, do you know of anybody or any other cultures or religions that are hesitant to accept blood products? I do not. <laughs> Scientology? Oh. I was thinking about that. I did read some about Christian scientists, but they're, they're hesitant to accept any. Anything. Anything. <laughs> <laughs> How about Scientology? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we were. Yeah, that's what was just raised up here was Scientology, and they're hesitant to accept any treatment. So the patients I've taken care of with Scientology, it, it's kind of individualized, like it's left up to them to decide. Yeah. And uh, Mrs. Conway. Mr. Hutton. I there are bloodless programs at many hospitals around the country. I, I was an employee of that hospital that had a bloodless system. They advertised the fact that they did certain, they had certain ways to hopefully uh, prevent the need for a transfusion of blood products. Mm -hmm. and that's Very interesting, gonna, the whole concept. Yeah, that's what we're going to start talking about a little bit now. What are the alternatives? Now, some of the things that you saw that, that you uh, worked with there, was it more the blood collection and the auto transfusion? Mr. Hutton? <laughs> I didn't know that was directed to me. I thought you had transitioned. I transitioned you into what you're going to talk to you I about. Was, I was transitioning into it, but I was asking you, what systems did they use? Was it more like autologous? Or was it... Well, they, do, uh, they do cell, cell savers. Uh, the actual techniques, the, they, they had the surgeons mm -hmm. on board to use uh, different techniques in the OR that would limit the blood loss during the procedure. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's some of the, like we were talking about, the autonomous and saving the cells so that they can reach an infusion. There are other alternatives, and we talked about some of them when we were talking about cancer treatment. And those are the growth factors. There's a chart in your book. It's on page 1112. This is 1112. Chart 3319. And it, it lists all these different growth factors. We've spoken about erythropoietin. Where is that normally located? Or where does the body normally make it? In the kidneys. In the kidneys. Okay, it's a hormone produced by the kidneys that is going to stimulate <coughs> erythropoiesis. And what is erythropoiesis? Production of red blood cells. Okay, so that's erythropoietin. There's also granulocyte colony stimulating factor, which, just as it says, stimulates the production of granulocytes. Okay. There's granulocyte macrophage colony stimulating factor, which is getting more specific. And there's thrombopoietin, which would be specific for the production of platelets. Okay, these are just some of the biological response modifiers that we're trying to come up with to be alternatives for giving blood. There is no true artificial blood yet that's been developed for humans. They're doing research on this all the time, trying to come up with something else. Because blood is in short supply. There's only 
so many of us that make it. I mean, we all make blood, but how many of us routinely donate it? I know of one person who routinely donates, and that's my daughter. Not two. My husband and my daughter both routinely go in and donate blood. In fact, the the um, Red Cross has them on speed dial. They'll call. I need to talk to you. We need you to come in and donate more blood. But if we don't donate blood, it's not going to be around for people to get. So that's why they're trying to do these bloodless surgeries or, and for people who won't accept it. But they're also trying to develop artificial blood. <laughs> Let's substitute. They haven't fully developed it yet. Okay. Questions or comments? Questions or comments? Anything you want to talk about related to blood administration? I have a question. I have a stupid question. Uh -huh. For the people that have to get the chronic like, blood transfusion, mm -hmm. can, like, well, what's with an AB person? They can get blood from any type, you know, mm -hmm. can they eventually change blood type? Do they eventually change blood type? Mm -hmm. No. No. Okay. And they're always going to be in mm -hmm. different, different kinds of... Yeah. If... Okay, another personal story. I'm A negative. My husband was told years ago that he was A positive. And I'm talking, you know, years and years and years ago. He's A negative. He didn't change. They had just mistyped him, or it was put on wrong all those many years ago. Okay. Um, you, you had OB, so you studied about Rogam and about how if you've got someone who is a negative mother and the father of their child is a positive person, they could potentially have a positive baby growing inside them. And during delivery, there could be a little risk of positive blood getting into the mother's system <coughs> and setting her up for a hemolytic reaction. So they would give Rogam to try to prevent any buildup of antibodies. Not to protect that first baby, but to protect the, the next babies. So it's the same. ABL incompatibility or the RH factor incompatibility that they're looking at. Other comments, questions? Wow. Should we start on GI? Alicia's saying, yeah, we should. Really? You guys want to get started on it? Or you want to finish early? Finish early. Finish early. Yes. This is like get up later on Thursday. Early, finish early. <laughs> we're gonna finish early. We're gonna we're gonna be okay on the, the GI. So, on a few times that you do finish early. So take advantage. <laughs> 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 